The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with today's message, Safe Forever. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. Bless the going forth of thy word, we ask, for the name and the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're studying in the 8th of Romans and come now to the great 33rd verse of the 8th chapter. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. The purpose of this section of the Roman epistle is to strengthen the child of God in his assurance of salvation and to, to let him know that being in Christ, he is safe forever. There is nothing more devastating spiritually than the atmosphere of the law courts. A good lawyer will always attempt to settle a case out of court if it's possible. He knows that there will be a real saving in every way if the parties can be brought together, if differences can be adjusted and a settlement reached. I want to act today as a process server who shall announce to the unsaved that there is a case against them and to assure the believer in Christ that there cannot be a case against him. First, to the unbeliever. The papers are hereby served on you. It is impossible that you should escape. The jurisdiction of the court is so wide that you cannot get beyond it. You may be able to interpose objections for a brief moment, but ultimately you must face the summons and meet the judge unless the case can be settled out of court. It is God who is the plaintiff in this procedure against you. God does have something against you. Do not be deceived by the oversweet froth that passes in some minds for thought. There are those who seek to rob God of his righteousness and picture him only as some spineless creature made in the image of man and who has no force of justice and no unwavering determination of holiness. But that God is not the God of the Bible. If we're going to deal with the God of the universe, we must take him as he presents himself to us. We have no right to remodel God according to our own specifications. Wherever we open the word of God, we find precisely the same picture of him. The first word of God to the human heart is a word of stern accusation. We begin, for example, with the words of the prophet Isaiah. God speaks, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. And what is this speech of the eternal? It is a word of summary of the evils of his rebellious creatures. Ah, sinful nation, he begins. And the fact that he is speaking primarily to Israel does not change the nature of his like case against every man today. A people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. They are gone away backward. We turn on through the prophets and the message is the same. Jeremiah tells us that the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. The Hebrew word which is translated controversy might well be rendered judicial case. The Lord has a judicial case against man. Man is to be brought to bar. Now some people squirm before the word and do not like it in this fashion. So bring on further witnesses. Hosea repeats the indictment. Hear the word of the Lord. For the Lord has a judicial case against the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. To his prophet Micah, the Lord spoke, saying, Hear ye now what the Lord says. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's case, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people, and he will plead against them. By now the clamor has broken out against my argument, and many are saying, But stop, that is the Old Testament. The message of the new day is quite different from that. We answer that the demurrer is not correct. The message of the New Testament is quite the same as the old in this respect. We turn to the Gospels. 
In the opening pages, we find a solitary figure walking the paths of the wilderness of the land of Israel, clothed with a garment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. All of the people are out listening to him. And what is he preaching? O oh, generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And uh, he continues to tell them that they need not think to excuse themselves. With this word from the gospel, some lips are now silenced, but there are still others that think that these words were spoken long before the cross and that the message for today, the gospel message, is quite another story. So we turn on over to the epistles. What do we find there? Read the opening chapter of this epistle to the Romans. Like the lightning flashes from Sinai come the terrible words of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. They are without excuse. God gave them up. They changed the truth of God into a lie. God gave them up. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in those that do them. Every mouth is stopped. We must begin at this point. God does have something against man. We must accept the fact that he speaks to us and that he begins in his own way and that it is not a pretty way, though it is a true way. The Lord has a case against us. He has a controversy with us. The summons has been served. Tearing it up will not change the facts. His constable is death, and we cannot avoid his hand. The subpoena is in our hands, and answer it we must. There is no use in seeking to avoid the issue. God's case against us, pure and simple, is that we are rebels against his love. I want to point out the importance of that wording of the case. For many have sought to avoid personal responsibility toward God by saying that they were not great sinners and that to therefore God would not be too hard on them. Oh, the world has heard so much of this type of speech that there are many people who go gaily on their way to Christless eternity without realizing the seriousness of the trial that awaits them and the impossibility of answering in that day when, in the teaching of Christ, it will be too late. God does not accuse all men of being vicious and iniquitous as judged by man's standards. He does claim that all have sinned and come short of the glory. There are some men who are veritable monsters of iniquity and others who are highly moral when you judge by man's standards. But these latter must meet the charge in God's case against them, as must the former. The principal charge will not be the outward manifestation of sin in acts of viciousness. The principal charge will concern men's righteousness apart from Christ. In the days of the Old Testament, the Lord did indeed set up the yardstick of the commandments, and men were measured by these and found to come short of the Lord's demands. But this was not because the Ten Commandments were the aim and object of God's dealings with the hearts of men. The commandments were given merely as a few suggestions to stir the thoughts of men that they might see the reality of the case. It was not that they had transgressed a few laws, but that they were rebels against the love of God. If a man says he does not need the Lord to work for him, does not need the divine mediation, does not need the sacrifice of the cross, that man has failed to see the love of God which surrounds him, which pleads with him, which watches over him. The stern words of condemnation and judgment are calculated merely to arouse men to the sense of their need in order that they may throw themselves upon the mercy of God and plead as did David, enter not into judgment with thy servant. The great sin of man is neglect of the love of God. This is why the great argument in the epistle to the Hebrews is brought to its climax with the words, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing 
and has despised the spirit of grace. So we see that God becomes the adversary of man in order to bring man to his senses, to bring man to the place where he sees the need of settling his case out of court before it be too late. All of God's dealings with men are calculated with this thought in mind. The Lord makes the rain to fall upon the unjust as well as upon the just. Do these blessings of common grace break down the hearts of men? Are they convinced as they see the marks of God's love toward them that they should turn and flee to him for pardon? No. The heart of man is in a state of rebellion far too great to be melted with such kindness. There may be some man in the world who has come to God through Christ because of the realization of the love of God toward an unworthy rebel. But I have never seen or heard of such a man. Men do not reason thus. A man does not say, I have a strong body while others are in the midst of suffering. I have food and clothing while others are in need. I have advantage and privilege where others have been less fortunate. All these things drew me to God and his grace. I confess my guilt, my rebellion, and look at his son as my savior. No, men do not talk that way. The Adamic heart contains no response to the goodness of God. Rather do we find men saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. This will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater ones. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, take thy knees. Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat and drink and be merry. But Christ said, thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. No, men are not brought to God by his kindness. In the prophecy of Hosea, we find the Lord sorrowing over the fact that men take gifts from him and thank the devil for them. The harlot wife, who is the picture of those who have gone aside after strange gods, says, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. And the Lord replied that he will put thorns into her path because of her failure to see the truth. For she did not know, says the Lord, she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. There are thousands of believers who hear these words, who know that this is the experience of their own lives. We were blessed of God, but it took a stiff shaking from the Lord to bring us to the place where we were willing that the rebellion should end and that we should acknowledge that our gifts were from his love. Indifference to God is one of the greatest outward marks of rebellion against God. I am convinced that there's more hope for a man who walks in the filth of sin than there is for the man who walks on the clean side of the broad road that leads to destruction and who walks with utter indifference to the God against whom he is rebelling and with a like indifference to his own destiny. Indifference to God leads straight on to the courtroom where the case of the Lord versus the rebel must be heard and judged. A man may be able to stifle the thought of God throughout all of his life, but sooner or later he must face the bar of eternal justice. David it was who cried out, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light around me. Yes, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Though you may have been able, because of his patience and tolerance, to keep one step ahead of the Lord throughout this life, you must surely come to the day that is determined for hearing your case, which shall be tried before the great white throne of his judgment. And how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The prophet cries out, prepare to meet thy God. And it certainly is not the call that most people think it to be, for that verse is a cry of judgment. It is akin to the lament of the book of Hebrews where we read, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God.
It was a sermon on that text preached by Jonathan Edwards that caused strong men to fall from their seats and on their knees cry to God their confession of rebellion and their desire to come under his mercy. Would to God that the Holy Spirit might take these words to rebel hearts today, convincing them of their greatest sin, their cold indifference to him, or else their violent hatred of him, and bring them to the cross of Jesus Christ, whom God sent to enable men to settle out of court. For be assured that if you continue in your rebellion, there is no possible chance of avoiding the condemnation and sentence. God has told us that those who wait until the judgment must take their sentence and fulfill it to the uttermost. There will be no suspended sentences issued. There will be no pardons granted to any individual after that great day. The Lord has told those who thus reject, I go my way and ye shall seek me and ye shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Yes, the issues of eternity are settled in this life. You have only to turn to the last chapters of the Bible and read the story of that last judgment to see how impossible it is to escape. It's the judgment of the dead, the dead, the dead, the dead. The words ring out across the page like a terrible death knell with a finality that is tragic. It is not speaking of those whose bodies have moldered into dust. It is not physical death that makes the difference. He is not talking about the judgment as being of all human beings who shall have passed through the grave. For long before the day of that judgment, there will have been a resurrection, the first resurrection, and those who have settled out of court will be carried into eternal glory with complete and eternal pardon. Blessed are they who are in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no chance. But the dead, the dead, the spiritually dead, those who remain in rebellion against God and will not settle with his son, Jesus Christ, these are to be judged according to the words that are written in the word. And the decree is irrevocable. There is nothing left for them, the rebel dead, nothing left for them but the lake of fire. Some of you may be saying to yourself, yes, I have been a rebel. I have been careless and indifferent with the creator of the universe. I have failed to yield myself to his purpose for me. I came under his just condemnation and there I am. I realize that I am counted among the lost upon whom his wrath must come. I would like to settle out of court. I would like the whole matter taken care of immediately. How can this be done? How can I know that all the claims of God against me are paid in full and that he shall never be able to take up the case against me anymore forever? I answer that it is possible to come to the full and complete settlement, but there is one definite commission imposed by God. You must come on his terms. There must be no holding back. There must be no stipulation on your part. There must be a full and complete surrender. His terms are simple, utter capitulation. But it is a capitulation to love. It is an acceptance of a gift of indescribable wonder. It's the answer in your heart to his declaration that he has nothing against you. That is the gospel in its most wonderful form. The God of this universe hath nothing against you. Perhaps you listen to this message in a prison cell. You state that the law has something against you. That's true. But I declare that God has nothing against you. Perhaps you listen to this message while driving in your car, fleeing from the police. The law has something against you and that debt must be paid. But we can say that God has nothing against you. Perhaps you're a girl who has sinned away your reputation. You say that society has something against you. That may be true but I dare to tell you that God has nothing against you. Do not let the devil bring you into any wonderment about your position among the elect of God. If you tremble before the word of his judgment and reach with timidity and desire towards the thought of his love, that is proof enough that you are his 
and that he has begun the good work in you, that he will keep on perfecting until the day of Jesus Christ. Who shall lay anything to your charge? God has declared you justified. There will be those who cry out against the injustice of this and will say that God has no right to clear the guilty. The answer is that he has put your sins on Christ and has seen them paid for there at the cross. He has punished Christ so that he might not have to punish you, but rather that he might justify you. Let us remind ourselves once again that justification is the act of God whereby he declares an ungodly man to be perfect while he is still ungodly. This is the reason why no one can lay anything to your charge. In the last book of the Bible, the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. But though he may cry out his anger and hatred against the believer, he can never be heard. He may speak the truth when he announces that you're a sinner by nature and a sinner by choice. But God knows that your sins have been laid upon the Savior and that they are gone forever. Accusations against men are brought by God himself, sometimes by men and sometimes by the devil. But God knows that his righteousness was satisfied in the death of the Savior so that he himself will never think of bringing a charge against you. He knows that men are puny creatures incapable of seeing the hearts of others or of knowing the heart of God towards men. He will therefore never listen to a man bring a charge against another man. He knows that Satan is an enemy and that he hates the believers only because he hates Christ with the greater hatred. God therefore will never listen to an accusation from the devil. Who then shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God has justified us, and the question answers itself. There can never be an accusation brought against the soul who has been touched with life by the Holy Spirit because of the work of Christ upon the cross. We are saved, and we are safe. Lord our God, we thank thee for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the way we have of salvation from sin, and we pray thee that thou shalt take the news to every heart, that Jesus Christ saves, and that thou hast nothing against all those who put their trust in thee. Hear us, we pray thee, and lead us on to Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen.